Friends, as we prepare for our scripture reading, I'd like to offer a prayer that we may understand scripture. O God, as we hear your word read and interpreted today, touch us with its healing power so that we are able to follow your Son, our Savior and friend. Amen. Our scripture today is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. It's another passage where we see the focus on peace. Hear now God's word to us. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Be restored. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. This is the word of God. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, it is good today on this Reformation Sunday to remember the heritage of the Reformation and to also remember Jesus, the gift of peace that you offer. Help us to hear your insights, hear your thoughts, God, as we reflect together on peace that is found in our tradition here. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. So today on this Reformation Sunday, in addition to the wonderful wisdom and insights of Jean, I'm going to share also some key wisdom from the Reformed tradition within Christian history. And of course, we have a plethora of denominational backgrounds in this church, which is part of the richness that came out of the Protestant Reformation. So I hope as you hear a little bit about the kind of roots of the Presbyterian church in terms of theology, that you can even find some connection to your own journey. Every once in a while, I want to remind you of our denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA, and some of our heritage. The Presbyterian Church roots go back to the Church of Scotland, and the Church of Scotland was started by John Knox, who was a student of John Calvin. John Calvin was the major leader of the second generation of the Protestant Reformation after Martin Luther. The Reformed tradition refers to the church tradition that has its origin during the early part of the Protestant Reformation, which began in the 16th century. So today we celebrate Reformation Sunday because we're remembering in 1517 that Martin Luther put up those 95 theses on Wittenberg door. And so that's really early in the 16th century. But then other movements came out of that, including John Calvin and John Knox. When I was in seminary back in the late 1990s and early 2000s, I was required to take various classes to prepare to be a Presbyterian pastor. I was also required to pass five ordination exams. We needed to be steeped in Reformed theology or the key ideas about God and Christian faith taught historically within the Reformed tradition. This morning, I will share five of the key ideas or tenets of Reformed Christian faith that I find especially helpful as we learn to live in peace, shalom, peace and wholeness. These five beliefs remind us that we can find peace through our loving God. So here are the five areas that we'll look at today. There are more, but we're going to look at five. Number one, the sovereignty of God. Number two, the centrality of Christ. Number three, the Holy Trinity. Number four, the gift of grace. And number five, the authority of Scripture. Also, before I start, I want to remind you that other Christian traditions have taught these ideas. But within the Reformed tradition, they are especially emphasized. The first idea I wish to highlight is the sovereignty of God. We got a great start on that by Gene. Thank you. What does it mean that God is sovereign? The sovereignty of God refers to God's ultimate control of the world and our lives. For the Reformers, like John Calvin and John Knox, 
it was important to understand that God is big and all-powerful. The reason this was a positive is that even in difficult circumstances, people could find peace in knowing that God would ultimately overcome evil and bring hope and life. The understanding that the loving hand of God was guiding the world brought great comfort. Charles Spurgeon, a well-known theologian of the 19th century, once said, When you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is a pillow in which you rest your head. When you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is a pillow in which you rest your head. I agree with Spurgeon that knowing God is sovereign allows me to trust that God will ultimately triumph in this life and bring healing and wholeness in the world, even though I do not always understand why things happen. Trusting in God's sovereignty does not mean that we always understand the ways of God, nor for me does it mean that there is not also free will, because I think there is free will. But what it does mean is that in some mysterious way, God has the power to bring good out of very difficult circumstances, and that God can carry us through suffering and potentially bring great redemption and healing. God is sovereign refers to God being all-powerful or omnipotent. It also relates to the idea that God is everywhere or omnipresent, and that God is all-knowing or omniscient. Knowing the power and depth of God is able to bring us peace when we find comfort in knowing that God holds the mysteries of this world and we do not need to carry that weight on our own shoulders. A second Reformed idea is the centrality of Christ. For Reformers, the story of Scripture and the purpose of the church centers on the person and lordship of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the full revelation of God. Christ is also our only mediator to God our Creator, and Jesus Christ is God. The emphasis on the centrality of Christ reminds Christians to center their faith on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and to look to the Gospels as the key focus of Scripture, even as we value all of Scripture. Jesus is central because He is the Savior of the world. As we have discussed the last few weeks, having Christ be central to our faith brings peace Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace, who offers peace to his followers. Knowing Jesus intimately is knowing peace. A third idea within Reformed thought is the Trinity. Many Christian traditions highlight the Trinity, but the Reformed tradition, through various creeds and catechisms, includes teaching on the Trinity as a central part of good discipleship. The Trinity, as we know, refers to God as three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God is one essence in three persons. This is a great mystery. Legend has it that St. Patrick used to use a three-leaf clover or shamrock to describe the Trinity. As a teenager, I learned the example of the Trinity being like water. Did anybody grow up learning this one? So water comes in the form of ice, liquid, and air. And so, three in one, you get the idea. Another helpful metaphor may be to compare the Trinity to being like a person's finger, which is one finger, but includes three different sections. At our church, we talk about Trinity as God, as creator, or loving mother and father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The benefit of the Trinity is that by caring about the three parts of the Trinity, we can learn all the different characteristics roles, and qualities of God. Finding intimacy with the Trinity through prayer enables us to have a close relationship with God and to understand the profound mystery that God is one community. God is a community within God's self. We get to join the dance of the Trinity as we grow in relationship together. Through close relationship within the Trinity, we find peace and wholeness. Shalom. A fourth idea of Reformed thought is the gift of grace. Growing up Presbyterian, I can tell you that the most important word that I heard over and over again was grace. It's why we talk about our church as a Christ-centered church of grace, hope, peace, and love. Grace emphasized that it was God's loving power that could change a life. 
and that nothing we did for God could earn God's love. What Jesus did during his life, death, and resurrection was a pure gift of grace. Grace also spoke to the power of forgiveness, how even a person that does terrible things can be dramatically changed by God and that sins can truly be forgiven so that followers of Jesus can have a clean slate and a fresh start. Grace also means that it is okay to not be okay, that the church, when it is truly being the church, is able to provide a safe place of, for vulnerable individuals who all benefit from God's grace, hope, peace, and love. Grace is my favorite word because it is a word that speaks to the unconditional love of God and the freedom we have to be human and not perfect. The Protestant Reformation highlighted the Latin phrase, solo gratia, or grace alone, to emphasize that we are saved by grace, not by works. And there are actually five solos to mention, or solas. Number one, sola scriptura, scripture alone. Number two, solo fide, faith alone. Number three, solo gratia, grace alone. Number four, four, solo Cristo, Christ alone. And number five, solo Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. Going back to grace, grace helps us avoid perfectionism and allows us to more fully rest in God's love even when we struggle. The last Reformed idea that I wish to mention is the authority of Scripture. The Protestant reformers were clear that Scripture was to be the authority for understanding God and the teachings of God. The reformers were concerned that the Catholic Church put too much power in Christian tradition and the leadership of popes or other ecclesiastical, ecclesial authority. And let me just pause here. We're a very friendly church to Catholics, and I want to remind you that the Catholic Church had its, very, its own counter-reformation happening, so the Reformed thoughts of the Protestants actually flowed into the Catholic Church, and we see more and more reforms happening in Catholicism too. So we're all on this journey of reformed and always reforming. The Protestant Reformation was occurring near the time of the printing press. So eventually it became possible for many people to own Bibles and interpret the Bible for themselves, even as they also were taught by pastors. My wife reminded me that Martin Luther actually translated the scriptures into German, and that was then given to the people. And so they were able to read the Bible for themselves and for many, it was for the first time. So what that was happening with the printing press, the Bible was gained into the hands of the lay people, and they, will, they were able to interpret it for themselves. This freedom to study scripture led to more lay people growing in faith. In my own life, the Bible has been a central way to develop my relationship with God. The Bible is filled with wise teaching that has shaped my values and helped me cultivate a personal relationship with God. The most important aspect of the Bible to me is that through it, I have come to know the story of Jesus Christ, who is my personal Lord and Savior. Sometimes I wonder what I would know about Jesus without the Bible. The answer is that I do not think I would know much. Not knowing Jesus would be very sad to me. I am sure you feel the same. I realize that there are parts of the Bible that are hard to understand. But let us remember that the beauty of the Bible is that it contains the story of salvation and the great wisdom of Jesus. It contains so much wisdom, but the centrality of Christ is where we focus in on in the scripture. That helps us understand our view of God and helps us understand the purpose of the Bible. I hope looking at these five areas of Reformed faith is helpful as we celebrate Reformation Sunday. I find peace in remembering that God is sovereign in remembering the centrality of Christ, the Holy Trinity, the gift of grace, and the authority of Scripture. All of these areas deserve their own sermons, but looking at them together helps us see the gift of the Reformed tradition more fully. In the end, these ideas hopefully open our hearts to a deeper experience of God's love so that we may more effectively show God's love and shalom to a world in need. As 2 Corinthians 13, 11 through 13 teaches us, we are invited to embrace the truth that the God of love and peace is with us as we live in peace and as we seek to be peacemakers in our world. 
One of the reasons why I've been talking more about our Presbyterian tradition the last couple of Sundays is I'm gearing up. I'm gearing up to be the moderator of the Presbytery for my first Presbytery meeting. And if you're new to that whole idea of Presbytery, representatives from about 90 different Presbyterian churches are going down to Ashland, Oregon this weekend. And I get to be the pastor who leads the conversation on all sorts of topics. I get to be the moderator, and I'll be doing that this entire year. And so it will require peacemaking. It will require a calm head and heart. It will require, um, hopefully, some ability just to relate to people well and to be in tune with the Holy Spirit as I lead and partner with other Presbytery leaders. So I just I share that with you um, to ask for your prayers. Please pray for me. I will be back next Sunday, and I'll tell you how it goes, <laughs> how it went. Um, but please be praying for me. And, and again, even though we come from a whole bunch of different backgrounds, for this season, you find yourself in a Presbyterian church. So one pillar of our identity as a church is our Presbyterian heritage. And as part of that, uh, we get to partner with the Presbytery, do wonderful mission work. And in this case, I get to go serve the Presbytery. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for exploring these thoughts with me today as we celebrate Reformation Sunday. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the way that you have revealed yourself in so many different denominations and traditions within Christian history. Thank you that you did work in a special way in the Protestant Reformation, that many doors started to open in that time, doors for people to read the Bible for themselves, to focus on a personal relationship with you, Jesus, and in a unique way in that time. Thank you that the faithfulness of many has led to our own growth in faith today. Help us work for unity in the church and unity in our world, and help us to be your peacemakers as we follow you, Jesus, and the Holy Trinity. We pray this all in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen.